Good evening. Welcome to the JCC Chicago Jewish Film Festival and to our talk back about the film Breaking Bread with the director, Beth Elise Hawk, who we're delighted to have joining us from California. Welcome, Beth. Thank you so much for having me. This is an honor. Thank you so much. Well, it's, you know, what, what COVID has made possible is it used to be kind of a challenge to Skype with the filmmakers in the movie theaters. And, um, and Zoom has made it possible to bring people from all over the world and all over the country together. And that's really been, that's really been one of the good things that came out of COVID. I agree. <laughs> but, um, but your film, your film is just, it's, it's a delight. It's a delight for the senses. It's um, the, the visually, the music, um, it puts you in a place, um, like you, it puts you, it, it puts you in a certain place and takes you away from all the, all the ugliness of COVID. And so it was a perfect film for the film festival this year. Thank you so much for those kind words. I usually say at the beginning that I enjoyed every little, little second of making this film. All those elements you talked about from filming it in production to working on this score and making the maps with the artistic uh, director and, and the fonts and all of that. So if the audience can enjoy it, I don't know, 5%, we're in great shape. <laughs> It, we definitely, I, sp I can, speaking for myself, I can't wait to get on a plane. Like, it, you know, like it really, it, I always want to be in Israel, but, but, but watching your film really made me want to get on a plane. So as soon as COVID's over, I'm going to be there. They did not do a film. They did not do the, 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 the um, food festival did not happen this year. No, am I correct? no, no. So, you know, so next year is going to be bigger and better. <laughs> Perhaps. So I think Nof now is trying to move it at some point before COVID, she was trying to move it to Tel Aviv. We'll have to see. Who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> so, so Beth, you, you've, you've had a very interesting career, right? <laughs> very, very interesting because you, you started your career kind of on the business and legal side of, of film. Right. Yes. And um, and then you produced Eye Candy on MTV, right? And, nice. and so very different from this kind of a film. Um, so how did you make the jump? Like, what inspired you? Um, I mean, I I think making a documentary. What's so wonderful about the opportunity is if a, if a story strikes you like this one did you can just do it. I mean, all these other things require so much red tape and setups and people and, and things happen and they don't happen and, you know, all kinds of things like that. But documentary, you know, it's in your own power almost in a sense. And I'm a foodie to begin with. Uh, maybe you felt that from the film, maybe you yes. didn't, but uh, you know, it drives me. And when I heard this story and it had food and it had sort of Anthony Bourdain elements to it. And I was, and I thought, you know what? I think I can pull this one off. I just, I just went for it. And I, like I said, I'm beyond grateful. So how did you hear the story? Like, how did you, like, how did you like even know about Nof's story? Right, it's crazy. I, you know, that's what I love about modern, modern internet, etc. But I was driving, I was stuck in traffic. I live in Los Angeles. I had the radio on, and Nof at the time had just won Israel's MasterChef. She was the first Palestinian Muslim to win, and she was doing sort of a PR tour, letting people know about this and her mission of bringing Jews and Arabs together through food. And I heard this woman, and I said, "Oh my God, I have to." meet this woman I I came back and I went on Facebook messenger you know I'm a producer in Los Angeles we have to talk you know and that was it we we became friends and at some point I heard about the festival she was doing and said you know what we've got to tell this story 
So that yeah. was, and I became obsessed, obsessed, possessed, whatever you would call it. <laughs> so, so um, this was not your first trip to Israel. This was not your first experience of Israel. It was not my first experience, but it's sort of a weird thing. I, I had spent time, I had lived there when I was young. I went to Hebrew University for a year. So I had been fluid in Hebrew when I was young. And then I had, I never, I didn't go back for decades. I had no connection to it. It was almost like it was dead to me. I don't really know why I had a great experience there, but I had no relationship to it really for many, many, many years. And then I had a quick trip for my daughter's bat mitzvah sort of a little bit before I made the film. But that was it. And, and I, you know, as I was saying to you before, I, I, I had no family there. I had no, I, I really didn't have many relationships there at all. So, and I didn't know anybody in the film business. It, it's just this crazy thing. And somehow, you know, embarking upon this, I have fallen in love with Israel. I have been there seven times in the last couple of years. Um, I would be there right now, as I was saying to you, if I could be, if it wasn't COVID, perhaps we can all experience it through breaking bread a little bit, you know, vicariously or however we want to say it. But um, it is a magical, magical place. That's all I can say. <laughs> well, and you really you really made it even more magical. So, so I know you're a foodie, but, but honestly, like the food, the, the food almost had like, um, uh, was almost a star. So the photography, the cinematography, it was really beautiful. Um, and so how long did it take you to make this movie and how many shots? Because I've talked to people who, take foot who do photography of food for like um cookbooks and that's no easy feat it, it you know they make it look simple but it is not simple to make food look good very interesting question first i must send my love out even though he's not here he lives in israel to Ofer Ben Yehuda, who was my director of photography. It was me and it was him and this sound person in a car for three weeks and nobody else and what that was one of my first calls uh i had i there was a friend here whose mother was a producer in in tel aviv so i called this woman and i said listen can you tell me who are the food directors of photography in in, in israel and she gave me a name i reached out to offer and i don't know he was obviously he's one of the best food photographers in israel dps i don't know why he decided to listen to this crazy woman from los angeles who had no connection and a string budget but he he went with me and he did it and he was incredible and it's so funny that you ask me how many shots because I, i'm trying to think how to answer that you know he would just do his thing with the food i would I would, we would know what we were filming and he'd take 10 minutes and boom, like for example, the knafe, you know, he went in, we, we watched, we had 15 minutes of a guy making knafe like in real time, right? Because he was putting the cheese on and doing the whole thing with the syrup and he just filmed it, boom, we're done. I mean, we did not have time. We did not have luxuries of anything. We didn't have a second camera. We didn't have, I didn't have an assistant, which you normally have on a shoot. I had nothing. I was getting home after 16 hour shoots and trying to figure out what the heck are we going to do tomorrow because I didn't have time to know which chef is available. I mean, it was by the seat of our pants. And he's just so talented that he was able to capture things on the fly, you know, but and and food, of course, my my instructions and directions were always like we've got to get the food and we've got to make it as beautiful as we can make it. But it was like, oh, do your thing. You know, they're making the moussaka go. <laughs> so, you know, it's it really speaks to his talent. And how did you find working with the chefs? Because, um, you know, like life in a restaurant, uh, it's it's fast paced and it's very tense. And those kitchens, it is, it's tense. So how did you find that? No, these are great questions. It is tense and they are busy and they're sort of, they love you, but you're kind of in your in their way, you know? And then you just have to be like a big personality like I can be at times and just be in their face, you know? <laughs> 
but I love them all and they love me and I've created these great relationships with them. They're so amazing. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, there's, they're wonderful, but they're busy, you know, because you're filming while they're, while they're in the kitchen cooking. So you're in there. It's, it's so stressful. A kitchen, a, a restaurant kitchen is so stressful. And here you are adding an extra element. I mean, I know there were times with Shlomi, man, I was, I'm sure driving him crazy that scene where I'm like, who comes here to eat? You know, like all kinds right. of people, you know, he's like, I mean, he's doing a dance in that kitchen while he's speaking to me because he's got all of these orders and he's probably thinking, when are you going to leave? You know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that they, um, I thought that the, the chefs, I love the stories of the chefs, the chef who's who the restaurant came through his grandfather who survived the Holocaust. And when he talks about his relationship with his grandfather, he's a big guy, a very macho looking guy. And when he talks about his relationship with his grandfather, um, like tears were pouring down. It's a sopra, right? It's a sopra story. He's rough on the outside and mushy on the inside. And that is what, you know, it's like you see these this big muscle guy and then he's like, he, there's, he's, You've never met somebody who's loved their grandfather more than him. But, you know, they all, that's what's so incredible about this film. They were all such wonderful characters and they all had relationships with their grandparents, which really accentuated the commonality of people, the humanity of people. I mean, I hope people saw in the film, you kind of couldn't tell often who's the Jew and who's the Muslim and what does that say, you know? So that was the, the that was the point, and that was I love that aspect of it. And, and it was, but it's it's organic. That's what's so incredible. It's, I was not doing anything. This is how it was. That's what struck me. Incredible. I even think just this, you know, the Ali Shlomi story, even even how how they were so similar on their own, even though they're very different, but how they, you know, they want to bring the food of their grandparents forward and, and, and it's so, and, and it drives them, you know, clearly. That was, the, um, that was the chef who talked about his, the sea, about how they used to go no, out. No, there's Osama as well. I was talking about Ali who came from Rajar from the village uh, near Lebanon, yes. half Lebanon, half Israel. Yeah. But, you know, the, the story from the sea also, I mean, you heard him talk about his grandmother and so lovingly and with such loving memories. So uh, we have a we have a question from Yael. Did and um, so let me while we're talking about it. Did you choose the chefs from a list of participating chefs, or um, or are these all of the participating chefs in the in the contest? There were lots more. It's just um, I was given a list, and it was who I could get. At the moment, like I said, people were busy. I would show up and, you know, the more I would met people, every single person was so vibrant and such a great character. By the time I got to, I don't know, 10 of them or so, I was like, I don't have time or any more bandwidth to cover any more. You know, we, we did film a few more that didn't make it into the film, but we certainly didn't get all the chefs from, from the festival. We knew we had struck gold already. I mean, and what was so crazy is every, every chef <laughs> we had such a great character. I mean, that's part of Israel, I suppose. I'll yeah. add one more thing about Osama. I just want to say um, that town of Akko, I don't know, have, have you been to Akko? I have been. Okay. Because to me, again, Haifa is magic and Akko is magic. And for any people, because I don't think it's a common, these are not common places that people tend to go to. I don't know why. Um, but Akko, if people are ever going to Israel after COVID, you have to put it on your map because it is, wow, just, it's like this Renaissance town on a sea uh, and, and it's just, you know, so beautiful and, and coexistence is going on and it, it's just oh, magic. Loved it so much. It, you know, I think that most people, when they go, they go to Tel Aviv, they go to, maybe they go to Haifa, they go to Jerusalem for sure. They might go up to, you know, the uh, Kinera, uh, you know, to um, the Golan I Heights or whatever. Yes. But, but, but I, I don't know why it is that like Akko and even Haifa, not as, not as um, often traveled to. 
I feel like Haifa, they don't, I, I, you know, they don't really want to be on the map. They, they are, they like to live their own lives. They are still, you feel like you're in the 1990s when you go to Haifa. There's, you know, the news isn't on, they're not on their smartphones. They don't really want to be talking about politics or any, or, or Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. They just want to have their lives and eat good food and enjoy themselves and sort of not get caught up in things. And so it doesn't surprise me. I mean, it's almost like they don't almost get the feeling they don't want a ton of tourists in there. They just, they just want quiet, you know? <laughs> they want to live their lives. Yeah. They want to live their lives. I think yeah. that, was, that was my sense in, in Haifa. So let me ask you about the music. How did you, like, how did you find the composer? And, and can you tell us a little bit about him? Oh my goodness, my goodness, Omar el Dib. okay? He's a genius, he's Egyptian. And I, I sort of wanted to continue this narrative after the film of having a Jewish Muslim relationship trying to do the score. I mean, we sort of continued that. And, um, and I was recommended this, this man, Omar al Deeb, and he's beyond talented. And I'm so grateful um, because a score is so important to a film, as you know. Um, and, you know, it was his idea to have the oud all throughout, which is that Arabic sound. Mm -hmm. And then I said, let's bring some violin in, which is sort of that Ashkenazi Eastern European feel. Um, so again, we had, we were trying to bridge that it, even in the music. And it's crazy because again, I was on a string budget. I'm calling my friend in Germany, who's a violinist who played at University of Pennsylvania. And I'm like, Catherine, please, can you play some violin on my film? And she would be sending me links on WhatsApp and I'd be like, oh, we need an extra bar here. Can you do it? It was crazy going back and forth. Um, and it all came together. And, you know, it's again, I feel like the universe was just gifting me this film. So, so Omar, the the he so he was in Israel. No, he lives in he lives in Los Angeles. Oh my God! Yeah. So we, you know, I, he's Egyptian. He lives in Los Angeles. Somebody had recommend. Somebody actually said oh, I met this uh, Egyptian composer at this party. That's how fortuitous it was. And I reached out to him, and then I heard because he had played some music on a on a previous film, and I and I heard it, and I said, Oh my God, this guy's unbelievable! And uh, I'm you know I'm so grateful. And we really worked. It was a labor of love to do the score, and again on such a string budget and. You know, I just, I can't believe, I, I'm so happy with how it turned out. So whenever anybody mentions the music, I'm so, so grateful. Um, yeah, you know, we went, we were, we were invited to the Santa Barbara International Film Festival at the beginning of the year before COVID. And he and I walked the red carpet and we were talking about this, that they were interviewing us about this, uh, this connection and how we were we were continuing the narrative. So it's very, very special. The music is, it holds a very special place in my heart. I'm very grateful to Ofer Ben Yehuda, the director of photography and Omar al Deeb for the music and as well, Nicholas Bateman who created these incredible maps and fonts, all of these elements really, and he colored the film as well. These are elements that just take your film to the next level. And of course, John T. Fine, who was my editor and we collaborated so closely together. and. I, I, you know, these are people that really, the film is what it is because of this team. So I, I'm really grateful. Well, it's, like I said, it, it hits every sense. Like, you know, it like just envelopes every sense. And um, even though you're not eating the food and, you know, you can't, you can't smell, but you almost can, you, you almost can. Um, so, t so b before we got on, you were explaining to me that you were, you want to do something a cookbook or recipes or something. So what are you thinking about doing now? Well, a lot of people are asking, how do we make these recipes? And that's the other cool thing about this film is th these, uh, at least from my perspective is you have these exotic dishes. These are not common dishes other than hummus, you know, the, these are uh, ta'ashimi. I don't think people are familiar with or monti. Um, 
Musafin is the Palestinian, you know, if you're Palestinian, you know Musafin, but I don't think people in, Lo in Los Angeles know Musafin or, you know, American in Chicago, wherever. Right. Um, so, um, so my hope is to create a companion book with these recipes um, and I'm trying slowly to collect them from my chef friends who are 10 hours ahead of me in Israel. It's not the easiest uh, task. I was saying, I wish I could just jump on a plane and, and run around and just hound them. <laughs> but in the meantime, they're trickling in and I'm practicing them. I made Salah Cordy's Kataya last week uh, for a first try, you know, I have to convert a lot of times the measurements, um, they're coming mm -hmm. in at kilos and this and that. And it, it worked and, uh, you know, the pancakes came out sort of like bellinis and they were easy to make and wow, it was so fun and I can't wait to, to be able, I hope, to put this all together and, and have this and then people can really uh, celebrate the film and have an evening where they cook the meal, uh, cook a meal or, or invite somebody that they're angry at over and, and they <laughs> make up over a breaking bread dish. <laughs> I think, I think it would be wonderful to have a cookbook that you could like read, you know, like ta a tangible cookbook, but also maybe some kind of a, um, like a virtual cookbook with music, with, um, with the recipes because I felt, I, I, I really do believe like music makes the movie. I mean, oftentimes we're not even aware that there's music. That's how that's, you know, and that's how it should be. I, so, um, so I was thinking about that when I was reading that you were thinking about doing a cookbook. I, I thought to myself, it'd be really interesting, especially now, cause we've all gotten used to kind of the virtual world. Um, watching somebody on a screen creating the food, but the music really sets the tone. So I just want to suggest that to you. I don't know if that's- Thank you, I will take yeah. it up. You never know, maybe to little put little things on the website at some point. I, I, I'm, it's all a work in progress, and I, but I, I really appreciate the feedback. So um, can you, there's a question from Rebecca. Can you talk to us about the husband wife team? You know, the, the chefs? Yes. Uh, she says, for me, the food was wonderful, but the real story was the people and the relationships. Wow, yes. I mean, you know, who doesn't want a relationship like Shoji and Fadi Karaman, right? I mean, right. and it's authentic. It's authentic. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to talk too much because I don't know if the, what they want me to talk about or not because, you know, because I, I, I mean, just by filming them, they're together so much in small spaces and like, it's like they don't want to live, they don't want a minute without each other. You know, that's the feeling you get. They're just so in love and, and it was all real and it's incredible. And the yeah. relationships between the chefs when, you know, that they were working very closely and they're passionate about what they do. Um, do they continue to be, do they continue with those relationships? You know, some of them I need to ask. So I, I, I know because I get this question and I keep forgetting to ask. I know that there was um, after uh, after we were filming, I know Shlomi went to Ali's restaurant for a birthday to have a birthday dinner with his family. I know, you know, so there's little things like that. But again, they're chefs. They're so busy. I don't know. I don't think they have too much time for anything, but I'm sure they would all work together if they could. Or maybe I need to ask, especially like... Um, uh, Tomer and Salah, if they if they ended up doing some stuff together, but yeah, it would be interesting to know, you know, like what happened after that because they spent so much intense time together, and um, and so you wonder, like, did it did relationships come from it? You know, it, in the same film festival, we're showing the film Crescendo, which is an Israeli film, and it's about. Um, Palestinian uh, young adults and and Israeli young adults and they're brought together to form an orchestra and the whole purposes of it is to to bring peace through the arts and um and that movie goes very differently and um and so this movie was just it it made us feel so good and so I really want to thank you it was it was just it was wonderful. 
Um, I thank you again for the opportunity and for allowing it to be out to an audience. Um, for me, I, I don't know if you can tell what a joy it was, <laughs> but it was nothing but a joy. And so whenever I get to share, I'm just so thrilled. So thank you. What are you working on next? Like, what's your next film? What are you, what do you? I, I, you know, well, one of the things is I'm hoping to at some point make it, uh, I would like to make a docu-series television show based on this film. So that's one of the things I, I'm, I'm talking to people about and getting that sort mm -hmm. of, I, that would be a dream. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a few more uh, projects like that. I'm very drawn to sort of arts again, like you're like if I would have loved to have made that film crescendo that you're talking about. I, anything where it's arts married with um, bringing people together really, really drives me. But certainly food, anything with food. I have a, a I, 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 my my dream projects have to do with food and and bridging the gap. Um, so that, those are the things that are that I'm really hoping to get off the ground as soon as possible. I have other things that are sort of more like, you know, sort of like the eye candies of the world, but but the passion is is the are these docu-series type things. Well, we're gonna watch for them uh, because uh, I, I for sure am going to watch for, you know, for something on Food Network that, you know, you, you produced um, because, uh, I couldn't get enough of the film. And I think from what I heard feedback from the people who watched it, they felt the same way. So thank, thank you, you so very much. much. I would like to say, I mean, if people did like it to please go and follow the social media and spread the word, it's going to be playing at Jewish film festivals. Uh, even this month, it's going to be playing in London, England, and it's going to be playing in Washington DC and, and New Jersey and Columbus and Philadelphia. Those are off the top of my head. So, you know, tell your friends and the social media is Breaking Bread Movie. So if it's on Instagram, it's Breaking Bread Movie or Facebook Breaking Bread Movie. If anybody wants to email me, it's breakingbreadmovie at gmail.com. Okay, uh, right. One last question. Yeah, Elle has another question. <laughs> if possible. Did you choose what to include? How did you choose what to include in the film? For instance, um, how did you choose like how much of the area around the restaurants to include and whether to include other areas of Haifa? So like, um, how, how were those decisions made? You know, again, I think it's one of these things that this was a very, interesting situation where we were driving around in a car for 18 days the three of us every day we were working 16 hours having to get back stories of the chefs that we knew we, we were going to include and filming the cities that they lived in if they you know that's how we sort of you know if we're if we were filming Salah, he was in Jaffa, so we would be filming Jaffa. If we were filming Osama, we went to Akko to, and Tel Aviv to film Osama. So it, it sort of was very organic what you would film. Um, each chef had an, you know, we went to Rajar for Ali, which was incredible. Um, so each chef, we went to their place that they lived. Um, and other than that, Haifa, we filmed the festival as it was going and, you know, whatever struck me as beautiful as we were driving along, we would film and then you come back and you sculpt your movie and you, you know, you basically write it in your, in your um, post production edit because you have 60 hours that you have to whittle down to yeah. 85 minutes, you know, but it, it's, it was hard because everything was gold, everything. You know, every well, character was gold. Every location was gold. Every food shop was gold. You know, it was just, as I said, a joy. <laughs> I have to say whenever, you know, I watch a lot of movies and, um, and I, I, I'm always thinking about, okay, so this is what made the movie. What didn't make the movie? And I can't even imagine as a filmmaker, because it's a labor of love and it's, uh, you know, it's a piece of you. And so I cannot imagine how it is to make the cut. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's difficult. It's difficult. You feel like you're, you're right, like you say, right? You're. I don't want to say it's like a child, but 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 yes, it's very hard to to. You know, you have to let go of things. You know, there were definitely. I had some funny scenes of Shlomi, like in his apartment with the dish empty dishwasher, and his opening his fridge, and he has nothing in there but Coke or Diet Coke, or you know. So there were funny funny things that you know you have. You just don't have the the place, and it kills you for a while, and then you sort of then you forget about it because you know. The film itself takes on a life of its own. So absolutely. It's not, it it's not be, easy though. Yeah. <laughs> and it has to be, you have to kind of keep it to a certain length to make it, um, you know, s frankly, like saleable and, you know, because people can only sit for so long and it's true, so but I'll tell you something very interesting. Um, somebody had told me there was a sweet spot for really the great doc, you know, if you want to try to make a really great documentary, there was a sweet spot, sort of 80 to 90 minutes. Um, I don't know if, you know, one of my great inspirations is, is Hiro, Hiro, Jiro, Dreams of Sushi, however we want to pronounce it. That one might yes. be slightly longer, but, but you know, the, the, the food documentaries that I love or the documentaries that I love, you go and you realize, wow, they really do fall in that space. And when I was editing at first, my film was much longer and I kept thinking, you know, that, that can't be like, you know, but the truth is it, after time, it sort of edits, it sort of, you find, you find the way it just happens sort of naturally in the edit that things get skimmed off that really are facts that you love and you don't want to let go, but eventually you sort of realize that you need to. And, and suddenly before you know it, miraculously, I was in that sweet spot because I was way over for a long time. And it's, it's funny to me now, the film, for me, this is the film I wanted to make. I feel so happy with this product and this is the time limit and it's the right time. And there's not an ounce of fat in, left from what I had to chisel away. So it's interesting how, how that happens. Well, you, you made a masterpiece, so. <laughs> thank so, you very much. You know, <laughs> so, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, it's, it's always a joy to meet the person behind the movie and to really, uh, you know, hear the backstory. And so you've, you've done that for us this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Everybody be safe, you know, at this time, be safe and be well. And, uh, and you know, we hope that, you know, it'll, things will get better and, you know, in time and we'll be back in Israel. Yes, from your words, to the sky. Uh, I encourage people to go order some hummus or make some hummus uh, and, and just, you know, try to focus on food and, and positive thoughts. That's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Thank everybody you. for joining us this evening. Um, please join us for more film and we have more talkbacks in the next two weeks. And, and Beth, I'm, I'm going to be watching for you on Food Channel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Have a good evening. You good too. night.